Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Cup of News, episode 57, where we break myth from fiction. On this episode, we're going to talk about some interesting things, but before that, I just wanted to say thank you everyone for listening and taking the time to listen and hang out with us. We try to provide the best news and put some humor in there as well. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. We're out on YouTube as well. If you want to watch the video form or some vlogs, check that out. Any other information on a cup of news or a cup of nurses.com, geez. And we are frontlinewarriors.com. Let's start the show. Yeah. Thank you for all YouTube subs, man. Like it slowly keeps growing. YouTube family is legit. We got a lot of cool content out there. And I love our YouTube channel. Definitely grown over the years. Same way your beard has has grown over these episodes. Yeah. And the family is only going to get bigger. We're slowly introducing groups and everything else. So just be on the lookout. We're growing. And then this amazing episode, we are going to talk about walmart manufacturing their own insulin which is going to rival all the current manufacturers and we're also going to talk about psilocybin and its potential effect on depression where it has the potential to regrow brain matter lost during depression yeah it's it's crazy what's happening with insulin and everything in healthcare because as you know nurses listening diabetes is one of those things that are on the rise we're like transitioning from healthcare to sick care some quick little statistic from 2012 to 2017 over a five-year period, 26% cost was increased when it comes to diagnosing and treating diabetes. It went from $245 billion to $326 billion. So this, is, this isn't going anywhere. Mm. And it's cool because Walmart decided to step in because no one is budging on the prices when it comes to the manufacturing. So they're going to undercut and we'll see what happens in the market. Yeah, diabetes isn't only a physically and metabolically debilitating disease. It's also a giant financial burden on people especially if you are not insured because the average cost of of insulin and of diabetes supplies is about six thousand dollars a year and imagine living on minimum wage barely able to 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 make a living to make ends meet and now you gotta pay the 6k for for insulin to sort of survive it's it's very it's almost it's almost cruel because we've talked about insulin a few times and Insulin has been available through many, many years, and the price isn't going down. It's, it gets higher and higher, it seems like, almost every year. A lot, a lot of people were actually going to Canada and buying insulin in, in Canada just because the price is a little bit less in Canada than it is here. And that's sad to say that we live in this one of the most powerful nations in the world, and you have our citizens going to other countries to get medical supplies. It's almost embarrassing, and that kind of shows you how America is a corporation and healthcare is a corporation and everything is just a business. It's very sad when you combine business and healthcare yeah. because it's, it's hard to draw the line of profit margins versus helping the people. Yeah, I, I was actually going to wait to bring that up, that like healthcare is a business. But if you look at Walmart, they're going into the healthcare sector. A few episodes ago, we talked about Amazon, how they're entering the healthcare center. So if you have these giant corporations that are multi-billion dollar industries, Walmart has the most employees in America. That's how big it is. And if they're entering a healthcare center or a sector, how can you not think that healthcare is a business? You know, mm. there's money to be made there, unfortunately. I know it sounds very philanthropic that they're trying to help citizens save money on insulin. But at the end of the day, there's a market that they're trying to enter, you know what I mean? Yeah, if Walmart didn't see any profit margins, they wouldn't have done this. It's not something that these corporations, especially these public companies, companies, they, they have to always make their shareholders happy. And that involves higher and higher profits because your core to core profits has to be better than, than prior. Your year to year profit has to be higher than, than prior. And thankfully, insulin has risen to the to the price where where Walmart is able to undercut the prices and make it more affordable because they're they're probably seeing that, hey, manufacture insulin does not cost as much as these people are charging for. Yeah. So why not undercut the competition and make your own insulin, which is a benefit to us, but it's also a benefit to them because they're, they're going to hit their profits. And unfortunately, if these insulin prices are wouldn't be as high as they are now, Walmart probably wouldn't have entered the game, which is kind of like like a sad thing to think about, but that's just how how it is. And unfortunately, that's how the, the world works. It shouldn't work like that, but that's the world we live in. Yeah, and it just shows you that it could be cheaper, but it's mm -hmm. not. So Walmart decided to launch a brand called Relion, 
And it's a brand to overcome basically common impediments like affordability, diabetes care, and accessibility to healthcare. So they're making everything more affordable. Uh, they're launching with like three different types of insulins, novel and insulin. And it's going to be regular, uh, short acting, intermediate. And they also have like the 70 30 for those specific patients. And the nice thing about it is you don't have to go through insurance. It's all, all you really need is a prescription and it's affordable enough to people. It's affordable enough for people that don't have insurance can, can, can buy it. Yeah. And if they have insurance, of course, it's probably going to be a different price associated to it. Cause I'm sure Walmart's not going to say no to insured people. Exactly. So if you're looking to just buy it out of pocket, like Walmart is making it affordable for only $25 for a 10 ml vial. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the price point from other manufacturers, those products range from $101 to $251 per package when it comes to like the flex, uh, flex pen, let's just say. So that imagine how much money you can save. The only kicker with this is you're actually going to purchase a vial. So you can't use like your pens that you had from different uh, manufacturers to be giving yourself this insulin. Yeah, but that they do offer the the injection packs though yes. too, so that's nice. And it's actually, I thought that we're talking about it, it's actually, I actually like where this is going. Because just like with all drugs and medications, there, there's a point where the medication is only available to to like, like exclusive people, to it a certain is. amount of people because they can afford it. And then over time, you see other people come in and manufacture the same thing or something similar, and they, they cut the costs. So I'm glad we're finally approaching yeah. approaching this level because I'm sure Walmart, Walmart was, was probably hearing people tell the government and insurances that they can't afford insulin. So Walmart did a nice thing and stepped in and say, hey, let's try and manufacture it ourselves. But and of course with a profit motive, but at least at least they're they're helping out with the cost. Yeah, hundred percent. Cause think about it. You have somebody that can't afford like their insulin vial. What if they're shooting up less units because they can't afford it? Uh they have to save up for the monthly cost. Not only that, but what if they have to save up money for insulin to the point where they're choosing shittier foods to eat. Mm -hmm. And that's a double-edged sword because now you're only causing more insulin resistance and everything else. That's that's not fair for a country of our caliber, America, right? Yeah. It sounds so proud, but yet we have all these loopholes in the system that we should fix, like affordable health care. Yeah, Walmart's doing a lot of steps toward towards health because now they have the dental clinics there where you get a cleaning for like 40 bucks and wellness checkups for like... 25 or, or, or sub somewhere in like 30 bucks, yeah, 30 bucks, something like that, which is which is amazing. But now the thing is, now that I'm thinking about it, is what's going to happen to all these these clinics that aren't in Walmart that charge higher prices? They're probably going to probably slowly get get pushed out, and those businesses that relied on those visits are probably going to be non existent because if I could come uninsured and, and get a wellness checkup for like 40 bucks or get my teeth clean for, for 35 or, or 40, I'm probably going to go to Walmart instead of seeing some some random person in the office and paying 50. Because when you're living on the cusp of, of poverty and or maybe low income, those things matter. Five, 10 bucks for me might not matter, but it's going to matter to somebody else. And slowly, as, same way Amazon got rid of these big box stores, there's going to be a slow, slow push to get rid of these, these clinics because it's all going to be available in, in Walmart. And once Amazon starts opening up their stores, they also have a push for healthcare. It's going to be another monopoly, man. It's and going the to government's be, not stopping it. Yeah. I imagine seeing these giant warehouse stores where you could do everything in it. And that's where, where it's pushing. Walmart already has that, that idea. And I'm actually glad that Walmart's doing this because I guarantee Amazon was probably thinking about doing the same thing. Because now the two biggest retailers that I see is Amazon and Walmart. So if Amazon was going to jump into the, into the health and wellness sector by themselves, they were going to take over. So now they at least have a rival. So now there's some kind of competition, which is beneficial for us because it's going to drop down costs even further. Yeah. Because if, because Amazon is willing to sacrifice $5 for you to come come to them. So if a wellness check costs 45 at Walmart, Amazon says, hey, we'll do it for 40, you're going to go to Amazon. Yeah. And that's just kind of beauty of, of how kind of capitalism works and another way society works. It's double-edged sword, like like you said, and sometimes we, we see the benefit of it. Yeah, so... That's the double edged sort of capitalism, just like you described. And um, this is exactly happening like in the food industry. You know, you have these giant co corporations like Procter and Gamble that just scooped up all these small little businesses. Walmart's doing the same thing. You know, just like you mentioned this year, just like in May, Walmart entered the healthcare system. You know, they purchased a company that a telehealth company. 
And they're doing the same thing that Amazon's doing. Pharmaceuticals, they're going to going to be selling generic pills for as low as $4 a pill. Yeah, that's that's nice. It's interesting to see where where healthcare is is going. It took a giant turn for remote during during the during COVID-19 and it's going to to kind of stay more towards this telehealth and Zoom kind of route. I I could see physicians instead of you coming in just a phone call or just over Skype or, or Zoom just it's video because most people are, are healthy and they still see their doctor. So they might not necessarily have to go get examined physically. They might just have to just have let the doctor know. Out. Yeah, just check up how you're feeling, how you've been. Hey doc, I haven't really changed my, my weight to this. I've been feeling like this and you might not need, need to really, really come in. And that's going to be nice because when you go to a doctor, usually you wait in line, right? There's, there's, there you're sitting there for half an hour or 45 minutes and it takes a lot of time and then you get in you get weighed the nurse comes and asks a few questions that all takes time so it, it's like a one hour two hour process sometimes so imagine if we could if we could decrease that time people are going to be be coming to a doctor and seeing them more often because it's going to be through video and that's going to be i feel like a big push for prevention because more people are going to see the, see the doctor because they're going to just be video based. They don't have to to schedule an appointment and devote one to two hours of, of, of their day for it. It's going to be to be more efficient and not in a personal skill, but on a more of a bigger wellness and prevention skill. Because more people are going to be flooding to see their doctor, which is going to, I feel like, almost balance out the cost too. Because people aren't going to be going to the clinic, which usually comes with a fifty dollar copay, twenty dollar copay. And now since you're going over over Skype or or, or Zoom, it's probably gonna drive down the cost but it's going to be backed up by the volume. You're going to see less cost, but higher volume compared to higher cost and lower volume in the clinic. So if you're a nurse entrepreneur, invest in opening up a telemedicine clinic or system and partner up and third party with Walmart, Amazon, because that's the future. Thank me later. Mm -hmm. um, and I also was going to say, I hope that this bridges the gap between like primary and secondary care, because looking at all this, this is still primary care. We're still... We're still kind of putting the band-aid on issues, you know, it's getting better, it's getting cheaper, but unfortunately there's still no, no motives into prevention care and, and caring for that. And I think that's what's very important and eye-opening to people that there is no money in that. Therefore, it is your responsibility for whoever is listening to take care of yourself because no one else is going to do it for you. Clearly no corporation. There's only primary care when your ass has diabetes you got to get insulin yeah that's probably the key takeaway from this episode <clears throat> if you're listening that even though it's not about insulin or psychedelics the biggest <clears throat> prevention thing you could do is just taking care of yourself like Matt, like Matt said that's the only way you can prevent things is, is by you taking action no one's going to tell you how to how to prevent it or what to, what they're going to tell you what to do but you actually have to take the action which yep. is how it works and yeah and that's why doctors kind of lost hope a little bit too and they don't care about the following up on nutrition or maybe seeing how your diet is and following up in three months. I'll just give you a pill because that's just the majority of the population. They're just like that. They're just dependent on something and the easy fix. Yeah. And I, I can attest to that too, because how many times have you had that patient that, that comes in for the same thing over and over again? The first time you educate them, you explain, Hey, you have to change this. Second time, same thing. Third time, you're just like a little weird. Like I already told them four time, fifth time. Like if you keep telling somebody to change, they're not changing. You naturally give up on them. And that's just, I feel like how some doctors are because they've, they've at the beginning, just like nurses, you're always that go-getting nurse in the beginning. And then you realize how nursing actually is. And you kind of learn to do it differently. And you kind of fall off on certain things, especially on patient education, especially when oh, you yeah. see somebody over and over again. But when you are, you're a physician, you're a doctor, in the beginning, it's great. You're changing lives. But then I'd be a doctor for three, four, five, six, ten 10 years in that clinic preaching, hey, change your diet, change this, go exercise, and no one's doing it, you're just like, why am I doing this? And my patients are getting sicker, I tell them how to change their lifestyles, and they don't want to do it, and they're getting sicker, so what's the point of me telling them? I'm better off just putting them on a pill right away. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the perspective. That's a very good perspective. I and mean, that just makes sense. You feel bad for doctors at that point, too. Because yeah. usually we associate them, why are you just pushing a pill? And that's that just side of the story. It's just this sad, there's no accountability. Yeah, and then, you know, the the patient doesn't want it, and you get that patient that doesn't want to change anything, and then he makes you liable for his health. And then you get sued because you didn't give that ACE inhibitor or the metoprolol soon enough. You didn't give, you know, certain medications, you didn't give a statin soon enough, and then you're getting sued. You're like, 
And imagine being a doctor, like, hey, I tried to change your life. I recommended lifestyle change, your diet, exercise, all that, and you still didn't do it. And uh, patients, patients that suing them is going to be like, well, people get pills for it. And you're just like shit out of luck because yep. you should have per standard gave that pill. But you're trying to go a step further and change his life for the better. Have him actually change his life. And it just gets weary and it just gets old and then getting sued and then you don't want to even do it anymore. Because you're like, I'm trying to preach this wellness and this health style and I got sued for it. Yeah. And it sucks. Imagine being that kind of physician. Like, right. you're just like, what the hell? And that's why you eventually slip into the, you know, you lose that compassion, if you want to call it, and you just go into it as a job. Yep. And, and, you, and you just, and you lose that and it becomes robotic. And, you know, even during COVID, man, it just became robotic because we, we lost that connection in the IC with patients and it just became tasks, man. Every yeah. day I worked, it became tasks. There was no communication with my patients, you know, mm. same vibe. Uh, very interesting topic here. We're going to talk about psychedelic and mushrooms and how could they, they actually regrow brain tissue. So this was a study on mice. I found this in a journal of neurons, neuron. And according to this study, psilocybin, which is naturally found in mushrooms, it was actually shown to increase the durable connections between neurons in mouse, mouse brains. So those that don't know how neurons maybe look specifically pr pyramidal neurons, cause that's what we're going to talk about. I think you should pause this really quick go on Google and type it in just to understand the structure of the cell because that's really important for this episode. And I found out there's a tons of neurons. I thought there was only like a few of them. There's a wide variety of neurons. These ones are, are the pyramidal ones and and I didn't even know they, they existed. I'm sure I learned about nursing school and somewhere on education channel, but I just completely forgot about them. And we actually had to look up how they work because yeah. I haven't looked into it in, in a minute. I know it's been a while, man. And it's interesting because this pyramidal neuron, it's it encompasses two thirds of the cerebral cortex. So this is the main neuron that's in charge of cognitive processes in the brain. Uh, this study, they took like a two photon microscope and they're actually able to look and image these um, dendritic spines in the layer. So it's layer five of the neurons, layer five, meaning how deep it goes. I actually had to look this up, man, mm. of the cortex. There's actually layers to different neurons, which blew my mind. Mm. Um, so what do these neurons do specifically? So before we go into the study, we should probably talk about how neurons operate, how they're creating memory and connections. So the main the main job of like a neuron is basically to transform the synaptic output, right? So it has energy technically, right? And it's producing an output. The output gets transferred down into that spine of that dendrite and it has that action potential. So once it's near another neuron and there's like a space in between them, they actually fire that action potential that creates actual chemicals, which relays the mes uh, message to the other neuron. And then the communication happens. Yeah. Eventually that action potential gets better and better, better as you're creating maybe different types of habits. And then eventually, just like, you know, your brain is smart is trying to preserve energy so it gets uh it, it requires less energy to fire the same synapse and that's where let's just say maybe bad addictions could occur where that just becomes second nature if you're smoking a cigarette for a week right just easier to fire that neuron hey i want to smoke mm. and why they looked at specifically the the pyramidal neuron is because it's associated with with the cortex and and of cognitive ability so that's why it's important for them to reach this one because with depression your cognition is is the one that's that's taking damage and that's affected. So that's why these specific neurons are, are found and, and used for these studies. And the thing is with this, I think you said the results, only 10% of it, um, it treated it or something like that. It was, low, it was lower percentage. It wasn't anything, anything like giant, right? It wasn't significant. So what that 10% was, and I'll, I'll just highlight the study, uh, the psilocybin increased the spine density. Mm -hmm. So when you have the actual dendrite, it, it, it became fatter by 10%. So it was actually able to handle technically more uh, density and more maybe axon, axon potential. So the spine signs increased at the frontal cortical cortex of all the pyramidal cells. Mm. So we're just focused on that one part of the brain where most, most of the cognitive processes happens. Uh, the other one was that psilocybin actually improved stress-related behavior mm. deficits. So the, the, my, the mice were, were actually able to better respond to stress. Uh, they put them to like, I don't know what they did. I looked at the image, but it looks like they stressed the hell out of this damn mouse. And if the, the mouse took these shrooms, it was actually able to be less reactive to its surroundings. Another interesting thing, it actually 
This remodeling, meaning the 10% increase in the spine and the density of the dentrite, it actually persisted for over a month. So after the, the, the mouse had shrooms or was injected or however, it was actually able to con continuously remodel the brain for this long, mm. aka neuroplasticity. I found that very, very fascinating. Yeah, and it also, you want to talk a little bit about, so with depression, people aren't 100% sure what causes it, how it's affected, but some people link it with brain inflammation and also a, a cortisol. And and with these mice, I believe the cortisol was also elevated. If I'm mistaken, if I looked at it, into it, into into it properly. But cortisol is also linked to memory, and it's also linked to the amygdala. So your amygdala is responsible for emotional response. That's why when you have depression and your cortisol is elevated, that's why you have these different changes in mood because cor cortisol directly affects the amygdala, which is your emotional response. People are are, are sad. People you know, are often fatigued, tired, and they can't figure out why. It's because this, this this cortisol is is causing it, causing yeah. it. it's just a giant giant flood of it, and, and it's a stress hormone. Yeah, and if you keep releasing cortisol long term, chronic stress or let's just say chronic episodes, it's actually going to inhibit, slow down, and eventually stop new cells, and neurons from forming in the hypocal uh, campus, hypocampus, and eventually it actually shrinks in size. Mm. So depression is one wild thing, man. How you know we, we want to figure out how it's actually happening, what's going on. I, I think that's the problem. I'm going to theorize here, right? Because we have this physical three-dimensional body and, you know, we forget that there's something that's in each and one of us that we're all interconnected, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's energy source, God, whatever you might be. And I think that's a huge factor of how things are being affected, right? If you have an outlook on life that's very negative, I mean, eventually your thoughts are going to create programs that are just going to make you more depressed, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, that's just a theory. I think that's why scientists haven't figured it out because what if it's something that's not measurable, but there just that's is true. and it just exists and it's just a different field, you know, just like that myth that we thought that the universe is all made out of matter, but mm -hmm. we kind of disconnected matter and energy, right? There's that one, um, what's the YouTube channel? Uh, the after school, one? after school, after school thought, after school thought. Yeah. So explain that. Yeah. And the thing is, like one of the studies that Matt showed only found it to be 10 percent effective or really insignificant or not, not statistically significant. But the thing is, with these kind of medication like psilocybin, and I know they're trying to to use other you know drugs like MDMA to help with depression and PTSD. The thing is that modern medicine doesn't help everybody in society. So the thing is that I always bring up, I feel like I bring it up every other episode where it's just like, if you have these manufacturers in, in the pharmaceutical industry that are able to cure 80% of, of the people, which is, which is amazing, which is great. Yeah. But then what about the other 20%? Do we just forget about them? Do we just let them do their own thing? Like a major depressive disorder? Exactly. So it's just, it's just like, just because we have this giant pharmaceutical industry always pushing pills and the pills that they usually push are, are fairly good doesn't mean that that that's the end all be all and a lot of times like psychedelics and psilocybin naturally occurring current compounds and molecules those are usually not for profit so usually people don't don't study them very much because they're they're not gonna make a lot of money off, off exactly. of it exactly but what if it's the best route for this 20 people that are secluded that are not getting help by by the the common antidepressants so it's just like very beautiful where we are going to society like oregon's has a giant push for decriminalization of drugs and doing research and i'm very curious on where this is going to go a lot of a lot of psychological issues seem to get some kind of benefit from low doses of mdma and and psychedelics like psilocybin and, and lsd so why don't we slowly try and try and increase the studies and make them more popular but the issue is always the financial. It's so hard to get these things tested because there's there's not a lot of money there. And nobody yeah. really wants to do it. Well, it's amazing that this is natural. Yeah. What if it's going to change depression in a permanent way if we're seeing this resizing and stuff like that? Because if you take pharmaceuticals, for example, their main thing is they're trying to solve the chemistry of the brain, which plays a big role, right? We found out that these dentrites, after the action potential, is releasing like the GABA receptors, right? Chemicals. So taking a pill is going to change some kind of brain chemistry that's going to 
potentially uplift your mood, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is if your thoughts are still negative or depressive, you may say, therefore your thoughts are always going to create the same energy mm -hmm. or the same responses, the same feelings, because eventually your thoughts are creating feelings. So your body's gonna have the same responses. Right. You could only change the chemical chemistry for so long and you're gonna, you're still fighting that, that, that internal problem that's there, just like diabetes we always talk about. Yeah, yeah, big pharma, it doesn't solve the issue. It just, it just puts a bandit over it. So if you're missing a certain neurotransmitter, there's a pill that can give you to increase that neurotransmitter, which is going to make you feel good for that point of time, but you're still not targeting the, the actual issue. And a lot of times with, with depression, is usually associated with trauma. So they usually push a pill on you and then they tell you to go see a psychologist or, or a psychiatrist and that usually falls off over time. But you're still gonna be taking your medication, right? Yeah. So a lot of times these, these psychedelics uh, like psilocybin and, and LSD, they allow you to explore different parts of, of your mind, of your brain. brain. It promotes uh, neurogenesis and it allows you to think about things in a, in a different way that you wouldn't be able to on like a sober level. It's they don't just they don't just give you this this gabble that that you're missing like a like a pharmaceutical. It actually allows you to think through what's actually causing this depression, and it's almost like you're like you're you figure it out in your mind, and then your body adapts to figuring it out, and yep. that's that's how the, these things work over time. Is is your body and your mind realize, hey, what's the root, root of the of the problem? Because that thought that trauma, that vision, whatever happens to you, that's probably the cause of what's giving you a low gabble or, or whatever right, the, right. The, the problem is. And once you, you know, fight that off or, or you know, calm down from it or able to, to get released from its, in its hold or its grasp, then you slowly start to come back to yourself. Right, because and, and naturally people, your chemicals are going yeah. to restore. Because how many people have been diagnosed with depression and once you see a psychologist and all they do is talk about it and somehow their depression is lifted. Yes, they had a neurochemical imbalance, but somehow the neurochem neurochemical imbalance was fixed with, with speech, with talk, with going to their past instead of a pill. Yes. Right? So why don't we try the natural current compounds with speech, with talk, with reflection, and that is going to be most likely a better cure or, or a better attempt at a cure than with these pharmaceuticals that just kind of, you ingest it and it causes you to release a higher amount of that chemical. Yeah. I think I think we should just run for the health and wellness sector yeah. in the United States at this point. I think let's we, try that first. I, I think we figured it out. Yeah, let's. Why don't we fix what we, we have first instead of adding things on? Yeah, right. Like when your, like when your pipe bursts. Well, that's the problem with capitalism, you know? Pete. Is we're just trying to make more money in different instead of freaking fixing the yeah. problem. Saying like, or if your oven stop stops working, what are you what are you gonna do first? You're not gonna get into oven. You're gonna call your dad. Be like, hey, dad, can you can you fix it? Maybe the light bulb's out, or like your light bulb's out in your oven. Are you gonna buy a new new oven just because you can't? Light the light? No, you're gonna probably switch out the light bulb or figure out is there a bad circuit somewhere? Why can't we, we do that to ourselves? Yeah, and I, and I, I wanna piggyback off this a little bit what you were saying. Same thing, for example, with um, cosmetic surgery, for example. Um, and th this is not every person, I guess, cosmetic surgery is feeling this way, okay? I'm just generalizing here before people attack me, right? So if you feel insecure about a specific body part and you're going to, let's just say you don't, you don't love yourself because you don't love this body part. And then you tell yourself, if I switch this body part, I'm going to love myself. You get it cosmetically fixed, but somehow after a week or two, you just have that feeling back in your chest and your heart that you don't feel enough or you don't love yourself enough. And it comes back. And what do you do? Get another body part? Or now do you just supplement that with eating food to cope with that emotional pain? Do you start smoking marijuana? Do you start going shopping? You know what I'm saying? That is always there. Yeah. You got to internally fix that shit. Exactly. Like some people that watch like a lot of porn that goes with males and females. You know, you always see that girl with like the, the perfect set of boobs or like, or like the, the biggest ass. Or you see that guy with like the, the 12 inch dick that's like, you know, <laughs> society I, I, I expects, right. you know, and that, and that mentally messes with you. And the first thing you should be doing is if you're that kind of person, that you, you should probably cut off like the porn, right? Not take a pill for, for, for prior prison because you can't get a boner because you have so much delimination with, with porn, right? So that, that's, that's the same thing. You're not really fixing a problem, you're just putting putting a bandaid over it. That's prior prison, right? Is that what it is? It is Say when you can't again? get hard, prior, prior prism, prior? If you prism? can't get hard. It's called prior prism, right? Prior prism. Prior prism. Dude, like I don't even know, man. Or is that like baldness? 
Here, look it up. Yeah, really look quick. it up before I sound like an idiot. Yeah, yeah. One thing I also wanted to circle back here when it comes to depression is this brain inflammation. So this is a double-edged sword because scientists don't know if the inflammation happens from depression oh. or depression starts from inflammation. What's up? Completely wrong. Priapism is is an unwanted and persistent erection. Oh, so you get so a boner anti. from Viagra, you can't get down, huh? Yeah, yeah, For pretty sure. much. Well, we're talking about the opposite, so negate that. So, you know, carry on. Maybe erectile dysfunction you're going for? Maybe erectile dysfunction. That seems like I thought erectile dysfunction was something else. Shows oh, you how much you know about mental health. I see what you're saying. I think you know you're. Saying? I think you're trying to get at where these people feel so insecure from mm. consuming this type of uh, media. Yeah. Where when they're with the real partner, they have these false um, expectations, b- expectations or beliefs, or maybe themselves, or hey, this thing is only mm. four inches or something, and then have that. They get flaccid from yeah. the mental part of that shit. Yeah, right? yeah, that's what I was going for exactly. For damn deep. <laughs> so brain inflammation one crazy thing about it that it, you know like i said double-edged sword but inflammation actually slows down energy production in the neurons and eventually the brain just drops it where your endurance breaks you're, it's harder for you to focus harder for you to read work all that so that leads to depression itself when you can't focus on things and you feel frustrated and that's one thing that we talked about with obesity and everything and the whole mind gut connection you know that we're we're eating shitty food and it's causing brain inflammation so now you're going to be feeling fatigued and you can't figure it out you're consuming caffeine blah 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 we always talk about this you guys know the gist you know it's 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 wild yeah i was going to talk about about brain inflammation but i completely forgot i just slipped my mind i looked away and i forgot it yeah and i and i think that's a huge important factor if you want to be a high performer feel great let's just say you're in nursing school and you want to study your ass off and be productive the food's that you're consuming the stuff that you're thinking about all that plays into everything you do in life mm. like you you are a being everything that you do consume affects this being so take care of it you have only one and understand that anger and sadness are, are normal feelings excuse me just because you're feeling sad for a week doesn't automatically mean you have depression you probably just had a bad week so probably happened don't self-diagnose yourself with depression because then if you self diagnose yourself with depression, you're going to be thinking that you have depression and you're going to make yourself sadder. Yeah. And you're going to almost be a bigger victim than, than, than you are to yourself. Because if you keep thinking, I'm sad because I'm depressed, you know, I'm, I haven't been happy for a while, I must be depressed. And then you're like, I'm depressed, so I shouldn't be happy. Yeah, sometimes you just talk yourself into it, Exactly. Right? And that's like the scary thing about it. And people talk, you know, people could talk themselves into anything. Like, like there was a TV show that I used to watch back in the day where people thought they had certain diseases. And they live like they had certain diseases, but they never had these diseases. And it was like a mental thing. They had to see a psychologist for this because they literally thought they had these kind of crazy illnesses, but they had no physical symptoms. It was just in their mind and, and their thoughts. Wow. And it was weird. And they had to get, get, it was usually due to some kind of a trauma in the past where something snapped in their brain. And now they thought they had this kind of disease or, or illness. And then slowly they're able to to expose these these false beliefs and these people were able to you know, regain grasp of their lives, which was very beautiful at the end. Wow. But it's crazy how, how what your brain could do. Literally. Yeah. Including the whole placebo effect that you hear about and everything that it does. Mm-hmm. Imagine what the placebo effect was during like COVID and shit, man. Like we literally scared ourselves into complete fear. Yeah. All right. So let's wrap this one up, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode where we talked about Walmart. It's undercutting price of insulin and entering the sector of healthcare and also psilocybin, how it's increasing the synapses potentials and potentially opening up the market for maybe psilocybin treating depression because all we have right now is ketamine so maybe we could add another natural form of medicine to it thank you for your time have a beautiful day let me cut this one out though ketamine is not natural peace guys peace